WK8ZT. And I'm Dennis Kidder, W6DQ. This is my contact information, K8ZT at AWRL.net, and my website is at K8ZT.com. And that would be me, uh, W6DQ Collins user at yahoo.com or W6DQ at AWRL.net. And I'm not so sophisticated to have a, my own personal website yet. So one of these days. Uh, the slideshow is available at tiny.cc slash BGHF. Uh, you can also shoot the QR code. We'll also post the PDF of this on the Rat Pack site. And this QR code will be at the end of tonight's presentation. So we're going to be doing three weeks of uh, HF topics. The first week, we're going to cover the HF bands operating and making contacts. The second week, next Wednesday, will be equipment and antennas. And the third week, we'll be putting it all together. Uh, we're going to jump back and forth today between uh, myself and Dan. Uh, so we'll switch back and forth. I'll run the slideshow, and uh, he will let me know when it's time for him to start talking again. So let's jump. go ahead and jump in. So HF radio. Many of us got into amateur radio for the lure of talking with hams in far away and exotic sounding places around the world. And these are some of the QSL cards I've been lucky to accumulate over the years. To do this magic directly without wires, satellites, or the internet, using radio, we need the high frequency or HF radio bands with worldwide propagation. What are the amateur radio HF bands? The high frequency or HF is the ITU designation for the range of radio frequencies from 3 to 30 megahertz, or uh, we're talking about wavelengths from 80 to 10 meters. For the purposes of this talk, we will also include medium wave, some low frequency, and some very low frequency. So we'll be going all the way down to the lowest amateur radio bands. Hi. Also known as short wave bands, uh, for our purposes, we will combine all these uh, together. This will cover 12 different bands from 136 kilohertz to 29.7 megahertz. The 12 bands are made up of six traditional historic low frequency, medium frequency, and high frequency bands, 160 meters, 80, 40, 20, 15, and 10 meters. Three bands that we're gonna call the work bands for the World Administrative Radio Conference, 30, 17, and 12 meters, and three post-work band additions, uh, 60 meters, which is the only channelized HF band of amateur radio operations, and it's an amateur radio operator secondary allocation. And we're going to, the two <laughs> newest bands, <laughs> the very low frequency and low frequency 22200 and 630 meter bands. Here's a chart showing the privileges. This is from the AWR website. This uh, links to this chart and many other ones can be found at tiny.cc slash chart maps. Anywhere you see this symbol of the little clip that tells you it's a link you can click on and you'll see this font, this sans serif font in italics. So if you click on that, it'll take you out to the link for that resource. So that's why you're going to need to get the slideshow in addition to watching the video. And this has a whole variety of maps and charts you might find useful. Okay, well, as you know, uh, the amateur radio service is covered by the rules that are set by the FCC under part 97. <clears throat> We're all familiar with those and it sets the different out frequency allocations for it, within the HF spectrum and the modes that we can operate depending on your license level. And as, as Anthony said, the, the work bands, have, they do have some other restrictions. For instance, 60 meters is channelized. There are restrictions on power, you know, power level you can operate at, the modes you can operate on, uh, things like that. And as he said, uh, 60 meters is also a secondary allocation, which means we can't interfere with the primary user, which is the uh, government, DOD. So in addition to the FCC rules, we abide by what we call gentlemen's agreements. And if you're familiar with that term, uh, gentlemen's agreements are, are a lot of these are things that have been handed down throughout the history of amateur radio, uh, just as to how we actually go about operating and where we operate. And while the FCC allocates specific regions of the spectrum where we can operate on specific modes, some of the gentlemen's agreements will do things like segregating a 
particular chunk of spectrum where we can run different modes, let's say like a digital modes or something like that, which are allowed in a lot of different locations, but we tend to try and keep that in one spot so we don't interfere with the other services. So one of the things is that the traditional bands that, that uh, Anthony uh, mentioned, 80 through 10, those are typically only ones that are allowed to be used for contesting. And specifically things like if you're familiar with do operating on field day, field day can only operate on the, those traditional bands in the HF and medium frequency spectrum, HF spectrum. <clears throat> so you have, you can't operate on, uh, on uh, 30 meters, for instance, on field day or during a contest. And there's a lot of, uh, as, as we have here, a lot of awards that are, um, that are uh, 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 given from, the AWRL and of course other organizations for using specific bands. Uh, one we'll talk about, we'll talk about DXCC. There's a five band DXCC. There's a, uh, that's been around for a long, long, long time. That is DXCC on the, on the, um, uh, the, the traditional HF bands. So the gentlemen's agreements are, are something to be aware of so that we don't, uh, as, oper as, as good operators, we don't interfere with other operators and what they're doing. So, how do we come about this, the uh, spectrum allocation that we have in the first place? This is actually done at a global level through the ITU, the International Telecommunications Union. They set up the frequency allocations that are set aside for amateur radio on an international level. And we are, we, the, the world is uh, broken up into three ITU regions, one, two, and three. And as you can see from the map, we are ITU region two. And this is something to be aware of. We're going to talk about working DX uh, in terms of frequency allocations. The allocations do vary from one ITU region to another. And you can see that in the, in the chart there, that, that region one and region three, a portion of 40 meters is used for commercial broadcast. So we have to be aware of that. And we may have privileges in one part of 40 meters that other regions don't have privileges in. And so we have to run, we can op, we can work those people, but we do what's called split. And we'll talk more about that in a little while. So, okay, let's keep going. Um, yes, and, and the considered operator's frequency guide, this is a good, uh, a good document to check out. Is that a link, uh, Anthony? Yes, it is. Okay. I thought that was, that's something that's published by the ARRL. And this breaks down the bands into those, those so-called gentlemen's agreements and gives you ideas of where, where we want to operate uh, particular modes at a particular time and what have you. So we'll have things like a calling frequency on some, on some bands. That's an important one. We'll have beacons on bands. So you don't want to operate on top of a beacon. And there's a, that's, this is all through gentlemen's agreements that have been, like I say, have been set down over the years. So that's the, uh, that's the link uh, that Anthony's got in there for the considerate operator's frequency guide. And it, we talk about things like, I mentioned the digital, there's a, there's a portion of the band we can operate digital modes, but we want to keep from interfering with each other. So one part of that digital spectrum, the digital portion of each band is set aside for things like FT8 and FT4. We operate PSK in, in certain, certain locations. We operate SSTV, slow scan television, radio teletype in, in a, a uh, a specific portion of the uh, of the uh, of that particular band. So, and, and Anthony also has another link up here, which is the um, uh, frequency guides and worldwide allocations, where you can find all of this information on all the ITU regions. So, uh, good stuff. And there's the considered operators frequency guide again. And yeah, especially avoid transmitting on beacon frequencies. This is really important. We use beacons for uh, testing propagation. Now, Anthony showed this chart a little while ago, or they showed the link to this chart, but this is the uh, uh, kind of a uh, compact version that shows just the HF bands, as well as the VLF and, and medium frequency bands, or low frequency and medium frequency bands. So you can see how the each, each band is broken up by modes and by license class as to where you can operate and what modes you can operate. And that, that is the, the, what the colors indicate. And they, you can see the, uh, the license class, extra advanced and uh, general. And you'll see novice and technician on there as well. So there you go. Go ahead. So yeah. <laughs> when we talk about the bands, we're going to see that some of the bands have a little bit different characteristics than others. Actually, all the bands have very different characteristics. But I'm going to talk about what I'm referring to as the atypical HF bands. 
And the first one we're going to start with is 10 meters, because sometimes 10 meters acts like an HF band, sometimes 10 meters almost acts like a VHF band. Also, the, the privileges for different license classes are very different on 10 meters than on the other bands. Technician class licensees have the ability to use voice on 10 meters. It's the only HF band where there's voice privileges for te technicians. Uh, it's also the only HF band with re FM. It's the only HF band with repeaters. Uh, it's very dependent on high solar activity, but you can also get sporadic E during any phase of the sunspot cycle. And its proximity to 11 meters, the CB service, means its equipment and antenna products sometimes cross over both ways. So you can see sometimes hams using uh, some materials originally designed for CBers, and CBers sometimes using ham equipment that was designed for amateurs, sometimes not necessary within the rules of CB service. So I have a very important message for you all. If you haven't noticed, 10 meters is now open worldwide. We're climbing up the sunspot uh, peak here. We're climbing up towards the peak. And uh, the great news is 10 meters is open. As we get into fall with in the northern hemisphere, if you haven't been on 10, get on. And if you're a technician class operator, this is your chance to get on and make voice contacts worldwide. 10 meters during the sunspot cycle means that you can have worldwide communications even with low power. Get on 10 meters now. You'll notice right here is where we're at, approximately in the sunspot cycle at the middle of 2020, at the, near the end of 2022. Uh, this chart only went to the beginning, but now we're getting into prime 10 meter and don't forget 12 meter activity with the sunspot being up. It'll only be around for a few years, so don't miss it. Some uh, amateur radio operators count their longevity based on not years, but on how many sunspot cycles you've went through, and you don't want to miss a good one. 30 and 60 meters are somewhat atypical also. Uh, they are uh, bo uh, both a uh, an, uh, work band and a post-work band addition. They both share allocations with other non-amateur radio services. So um, even though we have a primary on 30 meters, we're sharing it with other people, so you don't want to interfere. And we're definitely a secondary on 60 meters. 30 meters is limited to CW and data with no voice privileges for any license class. 60 meters is channelized. <laughs> And there's uh, special power limitations on both these bands. 30 meters is limited to 200 watts output. 60 meters is limited to 100 watts ERP. So that means both the combination of the power output from your radio and the gain of your antenna. So if you're running 100 watts out of your radio on 60 meters and using a gain antenna, you're not following the rules. There's a whole article on the AWRL website, and here's a link to it on 60 meter uh, recommended practices. The other atypical bands are the very low uh, frequency bands. These don't actually fall in HF. They're medium frequency, low frequency, and very low frequency. Uh, 160 uh, has been around for quite a while. It's been a hand band for quite a while. But 630 and 222 have just been recently added. They also require some special registration in addition to your license to be able to operate on 630 and 222, uh, I'm sorry, 2200. Um, because of the long uh, freak wavelengths on these, resonant antennas are very long, much longer than most other HF bands. This often discourages many potential operators. 160 fairly recently was been added to most HF radios. So if you have a really old radio, it might not have 160 on it, but it's been around for a while. 630 and 2200 are still not included uh, in, in a radio that you buy off the shelf. They've only been around since 2017. Propagation is highly influenced by D-layer absorption. So the problem here is not too, too little sun, but too much sun. So these bands become much more active during the nighttime after the sun sets. So coming up on winter with less sun time, uh, we'll start to see increased propagation on these bands. And there's also a phenomenon called gray line pro uh, propagation, which occurs on these plus 80 meters. So as the atmospheric noise goes down, the D-layer ionization goes down, it's a good time to be on 160. So I have some links here. I like to have give you some homework every time I do a presentation. So I have uh, three main links here on basically 
the characteristics of each of the bands. So there's one here from the uh, North Ongagana Radio Amateur Club, and it's I'm not sure where they got it or if they put it together themselves, but it's a very good guide to the uh, HF frequencies. And you can read through this. It goes band by band and talks about each band's characteristics. There's another one here from David Castle, Castler, uh, K0OG. Uh, it's basically the ham uh, HF band's introduction. It also has a video and a PDF, uh, which is atypical for Dave because he's usually just doing YouTube videos, but he has a PDF of this also. Don Keith N4KC has an eham article that's pretty good called Band Scanning, a Totally Biased and Completely Ill-Informed Look at 10 High Frequency Amateur Radio Bands. And I love any title that takes up at least three lines. I My wife tells me I always make my titles for my talks too long. <laughs> Because of the worldwide range of, of the HF bands uh, and the w characteristic uh, wavelengths and frequencies, each band can vary considerably. Typical distance ranges vary from band to band, daytime versus nighttime versus seasonal activity and distances are affected by D layer absorption and F layer ionization. The activity level based on the solar act the the ionization level based on the solar activity can greatly influence these bands. So we have uh, a number of cycles for these bands. I like to say that each of the HF bands has a slightly to drastically different personality, somewhat like a group of people, but also like a group of people. They have different moods depending on the time of day, the season of the year, the point of the sunspot cycle geomagnetic status and other uh, propagation affecting phenomena so the bands can change over time we are extremely lucky as amateur radio operators almost every other radio service has a fixed set of frequencies that are much more limited than we have with this wide variety of, variety of frequencies that means that we can almost always make contacts and we can pick out where we want to make contacts based on the potential distance on a band. So having this wide number of 12 HF bands really is a gift to the amateur radio service. Other than a few repeaters on 10 meters, all HF contacts uh, are direct station to station. I'm sorry, this is Dennis. Oh, is it? Is that I me? So. I think it's time for you. No, I don't think so. I think okay. That's so, okay, other than a few repeaters on 10 meters, all HF contacts oh, yeah. are direct station to station simplex. For simplex contacts on VHF, it's mostly about line of sight, but on HF, it's all about propagation. There's different types of uh, operation. Propagation between stations is dependent on absorption and attenuation of signals passing through the D layer, refraction and reflection of signals back to Earth by ionized F layer, and in some cases, uh, even uh, in higher frequencies, the E skip or E layer. Multiple skip of atmosphere and earth refraction reflection. Uh, there's a great um, Rad Pack presentation by Carl K9LA on uh, current status of sunspot cycle number 25. He did that for us, uh, I think, late spring, early summer. Definitely something worth watching. Yes. Dennis, you got to tell me when you're supposed to take over because I think yeah, yeah, really keep going. Yeah. This is still yours. Uh, okay. I, uh, let's see. Where am I? I pick up on thirty. Okay. Um, VHF is comparing VHF and UHF contacts. The differences. VHF is a lot like archery, and HF is a lot more like fishing. With repeaters and simplex channels on VHF, you make sure you have line of sight, aim, and if you have enough power, you make the contact. So it's pretty predictable. Uh, if you know if you have enough power and if you know if you're in line of sight, you're going to make that VHF, UHF contact. On HF, because the bands are so much wider and open and we don't use re set frequencies for repeaters, you choose a band, call CQ, and hope for a bite. So if your sport is archery, you might want to stick to VHF, UHF, but there's a lot of fun in fishing on some days, not on others. So let's compare the two uh, different uh Mo, uh, sets of bands HF and VHF. As far as distance goes, HF you can have local to worldwide communication. Propagation is dependent on the band and time of day, and it's dependent on sunspot and geomagnetic levels. On VHF, line of sight is the predominant method, 
It can be enhanced by using repeaters, but occasionally we get enhanced propagation such as e-skip, uh, uh, tropospheric ducting, EME. Uh, so a number of things can increase that. So not all VHF contacts are line of sight. On HF, repeaters are rare with 10 meter only uh, being the only band with repeaters. The vast majority of contacts are simplex. On VHF, it's very common to use a repeater. Matter of fact, most of the contacts on VHF and UHF especially by newer hams are uh, via repeaters. And they can also involve special modes such as DMR, D-star, and other purpose, other uh, digital repeating modes. Popular modes on HF include single sideband, CW, and FT8, and other digital modes. On VHF, FM dominates with a very small amount of single sideband, FT8, and CW. And a lot of this is predominantly on six meters, and a lot of it is predominantly during uh, contesting. But there are some people who do do long distance, weak signal, single sideband and CW on the VHF bands. Typical radios for HF are usually multiband, 160 meters through 6 meter radios. Uh, they're multi-mode, CW, single sideband, digital, and most of them run uh, around 100 watts. On VHF, uh, handhelds are very common, and mobiles are also very common. Most of these are single or dual band, sometimes quad band, uh, 144, 2 meters is the most popular, with 440 being the second most popular, and they're FM only. All right. There That's right. I pick it up. So, modes on HF band. Uh, so, Anthony kind of glossed over what the modes are. We're going to talk a little bit more about that now. Uh, the voice, or what we call uh, phone operating, is predominantly single sideband. And of course, on 10 meters, there's a limited amount of FM on, on 10 meters, but we also do AM. Now, AM is a, a lot of folks refer to that as ancient modulation. I think of it as uh, what we call it in the AM groups is angel mod, angel music. <laughs> we actually operate AM here as a, it's, a, you know, it's a historical thing. And we operate a lot of vintage equipment uh, doing AM. And it's a lot of fun because you get some really incredible fidelity. Sideband, you know, it's the, uh, it's the, the, uh, the uh, Donald Duck sound on single sideband. CW is available, you know, this is using Morse code, CW, continuous wave avail available on all bands and other than 10 meters, uh, it's the only HF allocation for the tech class licenses. Technician class can operate CW on some of the HF bands. And I encourage folks to do that, I absolutely do that. The digital modes, the traditional digital mode, of, the, the most traditional, tra <laughs> If I could speak English, the most traditional digital mode would be radio teletype, which is a, another one of the old legacy modes from, from many, many years back. And it's a lot of fun to do teletype, but primarily it shows up on contests these days. And in more recent years, uh, teletype was replaced by PSK uh, because of improvements in the, um, in, the, uh, the, the, in the protocol that allowed you to have better signal to noise ratio. So you could, you could actually copy weaker signals with PSK. But some of the newer digital modes basically rely on a computer and a uh, sound card on your computer. And these are things like FT4 and FT8, which have become really worldwide acceptance for uh, DX. And the beauty of FT4 and FT8, and in particular FT8, is it allows you to use a very, very compromised system. So I, I refer to it as, as a system. It's your combination of your radio and your antenna and your feed and all of that, your location. If you're in a compromised situation where you have a, a, a smaller antenna or a less efficient antenna and you're only running a low power, FT8 is really a champion for that. So something to be aware of. Uh, there's other digital sound card modes. We talk about whisper, weak signal propagation reporting, which is really useful to find out how the band is doing from a, your location and who could actually hear you. So that's whisper. Uh, we have image modes like slow scan television. Slow scan television is is actually operated on a on a voice. Uh, I won't call it a channel, but basically a chunk of of uh, a single sideband uh, bandwidth. So less than three kilohertz, and we can send fixed images over. Um, that's what's going on. My phone's going off. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, we can send a, a, a basically a still image over that radio channel over three kilohertz or less using uh, slow scan television. That's another one that's been around for a long time. And 
it's it's improved greatly over the years. I mean, when I first got into slow scan, it was uh, green and black because I was using a long persistence uh, uh, CRT cathode ray tube that so they would store the image, and so it was a green image. Nowadays, we get uh, full color and really high resolution images on slow scan. So it's another interesting mode. So SSB is the primary mode of voice communications on HF. Uh, and, and in the 1960s, it did replace uh, most of AM activity. AM primarily was the primary voice mode prior to that. It was the only voice mode prior to that time. Uh, other than, well, I, sh I shouldn't say that on HF, yes. Uh, FM obviously was used on the, on the VHF bands, but, but uh, HF was particularly uh, AM. And I said earlier, if you don't tune sideband incorrectly, it kind of sounds like Donald Duck. So you have to you have to be careful and, and tune that in carefully. Um, one of the things that I will comment about, for, especially for for technicians who are who have recently upgraded and have spent a lot of time on, let's say, two meters FM. Yeah, there's so many more modes available to you now that you have a, a if you've upgraded to your general or your extra that especially things like uh, single sideband and as, as well as the digital modes are really something to investigate. Uh, you can run a, a FM on uh, HF, but only on a small portion of 10 meters. So uh, we, do run, uh, we do run AM, as I mentioned, and as you say here on, on 75 meters in the 75 meter portion of 80 meters, it tends to be at the high, high end of the band around 3,900. And uh, we also run at the high end of 40 meters as well as all the way up to 10 meters running AM. So digital voice is a new thing on the, on the horizon here. It's, it's still very experimental, uh, but uh, there's, some, there's some free software, free DV, free digital voice. And we, did a, we had a presentation here on Rat Pack. Uh, That's upcoming. Uh, no, I was, oh, that is upcoming, isn't it? Yeah, it hasn't, what was the one, I thought we, oh, I know what it was. Yeah, it was another uh, digital voice mode that we talked about. Uh, uh, I think that was something that, that Michelle had on here and I don't remember what that was, but, but uh, it was another digital mode uh, that uh, is available on HF. But yeah, you're right. This one's coming up next month. Sorry about that. But that will be on Rat Pack. They're going to be here presenting about that. So I mentioned CW Morse code and Morse code is a is a kick. I you know that's what I started with as a novice. Uh, many of us that started out as novices uh, uh, were doing uh, doing Morse code. We had to. That's all we were allowed to do. And uh, as you can see, Anthony's got a link here. Having fun with Morse and do uh, do check out that link. Uh, I mentioned. Yeah, just, yeah, I just ahead. want to interrupt you for a second. Yeah, In go that, right ahead. In that presentation, there's a lot of information about learning more as code also, and I, I can really strong, strongly recommend two groups, the uh, CW yeah. Academy Ops group and the uh, CW Ops Academy group and the uh, Long, Long Island, Island CW group. Right. If you go back through Rat Pack, we have interviews with both of those groups talking about how to learn more as code. These guys, if you want to learn Morse code, Anthony's absolutely correct. That's where to go to, to, to do it. it they, they're really great. They're a lot of fun. Uh, they make a make a learning Morse code fun for you. So, uh, and it's it's open to, I think Long Island CW, uh, is that free? free membership? Long Island CW, you have to pay a, a membership That's fee a membership. to join. Yeah. Uh, but the CW Ops Academy absolutely. is free. Yeah, it's free. I knew one of them was free. Thank you. All right, so digital, I mentioned FT8 and FT4. These are really interesting modes. FT8 was, was a bit of a revolution uh, in amateur radio. Uh, we thank uh, uh, Joe Taylor, uh, oh, K1JT. Yes. Yeah, K1JT. Believe it or not, he's a Nobel laureate in radio astronomy. And one of the things that came out of his research in radio astronomy was dealing with weak signals from the from the stars. And he was very much into things like meteor scatter on VHF. Well, he developed some software that took advantage of the weak signal modes that he had developed for radio astronomy to, to uh, uh, do meteor scatter on, on six and two meters. Well, this evolved into what is now, we know as FT8 and FT4. And these things work with incredibly, uh, incredibly uh, low signal levels, way below the noise level. And it's really remarkable. And that's why I say before, if you're in a, if you're in a compromised situation, maybe you're in, a, in an HOA 
uh, you have HOA exclusions that you can't have an, ex an external antenna or you have to hide it through camouflage, uh, whatever. Uh, FT8 is your friend and you'll work the world with that. So there you go. Uh, I mentioned the, the others, you know, teletype and all that. They're fun. They're fun to play with. They're interesting to explore. So keep an eye out for that. We'll talk more about that when we talk about contests too. So most by license on the HF bands, license class is important because it allows you to operate in particular portions of each of the bands. So you're limited in what you can do if you have the technician or general class privileges, or even today, if you still have a novice class license, which are still out there, uh, you're restricted on where you can operate and what you can do. Of course, the amateur extra class allows you to have full privileges uh, across the bands. But this gives you a breakdown of uh, of how those uh, how the how the modes by license break down on the band here. You can see in this chart. So the digital modes, what what we've got there on the digital modes includes the PSK teletype, uh, FT8, FT4, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, the um, general and extra class uh, voice privileges include SSB and AM as well as FM on 10, and the technician voice is limited to a single sideband only on on 10 meters. So there you go. Uh, let's see, this is the current, this is a breakdown of the current technician class license privileges we've been talking about. So if you're currently a technician and you want to get on HF, here you go, here's your opportunity. You have, you have 80, 40, and 15 meters. You have basically a chunk of spectrum where you can operate CW. And this is a great place to get started with it. And of course, on 10 meters, you've got SSB phone and you've got uh, really teletype data, data modes. There, you can see how the band is broken down. So there you go. Okay, let's see. I think, yeah, we're, we're, I go all the way to the end, I think, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Anthony. So let's, let's keep going here. Okay, the type, let's talk about actual operating on the bands. What type of contacts can you make? See, you're, if, you're, if you're typically using a repeater, you know how your contacts go there. You may, you may go up and just put your call sign out there on the repeater and somebody will come back to you. Well, on HF, you can make a random call like that, but what you're gonna do is call CQ. CQ is, a, again, a, 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 a pro sign that goes way, way, way back in, in radio. Is basically, is anybody out there who wants to talk to me? That's what you're saying. And someone will answer you. And that's just random. You don't know who you're gonna to talk to. It's like fishing, Anthony's an analogy of fishing. You don't know who's gonna come back to you or if anybody's gonna come back to you. Or, you answer someone who is calling CQ. And that's that, that's the fun of this, a random con you, contacts. You're never gonna know what you find on the other end. The other is, uh, is what, what he refers to as serial. And this is typical in a DX situation where there's a lot of stations calling a DX, uh, a DX station. He may be calling CQ and he's got what we call a pile up on top of it. And it's chaos. So he's going to work those stations one by one. He's going to pick the ones he can hear first and loudest, possibly, or the ones that just stand out. It could be uh, some of the things that really work on, on working DX is if you're a YL, uh, a YL's voice will, will cut through a lot of the QRM and uh, they'll come back to you. Uh, a lot of times folks run low power QRP. Uh, there'll be a station running QRP and the DX station will go back to the QRP station if they're able to hear them. But typically we have two modes of operation there. We, we're on one frequency where the, the station is calling CQ on one frequency and we respond on the same frequency. This can be a nightmare <laughs> to tell you the truth. Uh, more than likely you'll find a, a rare DX station running split operation. And in split operation, the, the DX station is calling CQ on one frequency and everybody's answering on another frequency or a chunk of frequencies. They're spread across a, 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 piece, of the, a piece of the spectrum. And that's where you'll hear the DX station saying something like listening five or listening 10 up. He's talking about, well, I'm listening 10 kilohertz up. And the trick here is to listen to who he's talking to last. Who is he talking to right now? And that's the guy you want to be on top of when he finishes. You want to call him on that same frequency. Oh, I just gave away a secret. <laughs> oh, well. But uh, that's, a, that's a trick for, uh, you know, that, that's, that's where he's listening. So that's the frequency you want to be transmitting on. So another mode of operation is contest or contesting. And 
in a contest, yeah, I mentioned field day earlier. In a contest, we try to work as many other stations that are involved in the contest as, as possible in the designated time that the con contest takes place. And I mentioned field day, that's a good example of it. We try and work as many other stations in that contest as possible. There's some great contests. There's one coming up next month, actually two, that, that we call the sweepstakes. There's both CW and phone sweepstakes. And this is a great opportunity to get on HF and make lots and lots of contacts. And you'd be surprised what you can find out there. So sweepstakes is coming. Uh, we also have in the contest, if you're into contesting, and these things can get quite competitive. Uh, we have, uh, we're, basically there are awards given for contesting for the highest scores. We keep score. And as we mentioned here, there's point multipliers for things like states, counties, zones, uh, prefixes, and in, in like working DX, a DX prefix might count as a multiplier or a DX entity, a country might count as a multiplier. Uh, it, it like in VHF, uh, we talk about in VHF contests, uh, grid squares as a multiplier. It's the same kind of idea. And again, you have those two types of operations where you have a station that's calling CQ. He's he, that, that contest station has got a big signal. Everybody can hear him and he calls CQ and he gets everybody calling him. And so you might, you might, uh, happen onto him and be able to give him a call and, and make that contact. What he is doing is what is referred to as running. He's running the contest there. He's running that frequency. And so he just continues calling CQ. And it, what he'll do is he'll call CQ, station comes back when he completes that, or uh, when he's done, he'll say QRZ and give his call sign generally. Uh, you might have to listen to a few cycles to figure out what his call sign is, because he might not give it every time, which is no, no. But anyway. Um, the other type of operation, and this might be better for somebody who's just starting out, is this idea of hunting for and answering CQs with search and pounce. Uh, this is for someone starting out that's not really done this before and wants to get a taste for it. This is a good way to operate, is to just search around the band, listen for somebody calling CQ in a contest and give them a call. Uh, so that's uh, yet another opportunity. Let's see, I think we go to the, go ahead and yeah, okay, next chart. Uh, I was gonna say one thing about the last one on the, um, in contesting, we talk about, <clears throat> I think we talk about this later, but it's really important. I don't wanna gloss, gloss over this because in a contest, the exchange, what you're exchanging with the other station is important. It varies from contest to contest. If you think about field day, the field day exchange is your section, your ARRL section, and your class of operation. So it's the number of transmitters you have and their, your, your, your power class, you know, are you, are you battery, are you portable, are you running off a generator, are you running off mains? These are the types of things that we're talking about when the exchange. So other contests have different types of exchanges. Like for instance, uh, what we call a serial number might be the number of the contact. You keep track of how many contacts you made. This is contest, serial number would be the number of that contact. So. You're here, you're sitting there, one, two, three, four, and there's a guy that you're listening to that's 1,347. You're like, oh my gosh, those are the contesters. <laughs> okay, so the types of contacts that we do on, on HF bands, uh, we talk about round tables. And so it's, it's like, a, a, as you say here, an on-the-air gathering of three or more operators, like a group chat in a chat room, but each person takes a turn. Okay, each person takes a turn in a round table and it goes around, it just goes around the table in a loop. And then the other thing is a net. We have nets on HF. And this is another honor gathering, but this is a little bit different where there's actually a station that's in control, just like we'd have a net on VHF. We have nets on HF and you have what's called a net control operator. But we'll have more on this, these, these two things later on. We'll talk in more detail about how that goes. So I mentioned the pure chance. This is the beauty of, of what's so wonderful about amateur radio. Call CQ and listen for a reply. You tune around or you listen for it and you listen for a CQ. You, you never know what you're gonna get. You, know, you don't know what's out there. You may not get anything at all, but on the other hand, you may be really surprised and, and get, make some really great contacts, even you know, work DX and what have you, just calling CQ. Uh, as as uh, Anthony mentioned earlier about the um, solar conditions and geomagnetic conditions, 
checking out that information. And there's a lot of good sources that you that are updated constantly that you can check out helps you to choose what band to operate in, depending on the time of day, the season of the year, et cetera. You know, we're, we're going into fall now, we're gonna be in winter. Conditions change in winter from summer and spring. So we're looking forward to having some band conditions shifting for, for things like, like Anthony mentioned, 80 and, or 80 and 160 will change. Uh, the other thing you can do is there's lots of things online that you can put to your advantage and so-called spotting, what we call spotting sites, spotters. So a spotting site, uh, people actually upload information to that spotting site. If they hear a station or they work a station, a particular DX, uh, if you work a particular DX station, you'll go onto the spotting site and upload uh, your call sign and the call sign of the DX station and the frequency and mode. You know, frequency is really all you really need to put up there. But, but um, that's, a, that's a good way to find contacts. And if you're interested in working DX, that's a good way to locate DX. Uh, getting on the air during periods of high activity is another way to improve your odds. Weekends are great. There's a lot of activity on the weekends. Uh, time of day, you'll find that in the evenings, this time of the evening, there's a lot more activity on the lower bands like 80 and 40 than there would be during the day. Uh, and in particular, there's really very little activity on 80 meters during the day or 75 meters phone. Uh, the months that we mentioned, the, the time of the year, September to April, it's going to be very active on some of the uh, uh, lower bands. Uh, high sunspot activity, we're going into a solar peak. It's going to be, I got to tell you, <laughs> it's going to be awesome. This is going to be a great solar peak this time. Uh, we're looking to some really great propagation. It's really the time you want to get on HF. Um, look, for, um, look for scheduled events like NETS. Nets always welcome visitors. I shouldn't say always. There are a few nets that don't welcome visitors. I'm aware of some of those. And there are, uh, there are particular nets, like for instance, here in California, we have the California Office of Emergency Services conducts a net, uh, several nets weekly, and those are restricted to members of Cal OES. They don't allow visitors on that net. They just, they just aren't, they don't check them in. But most nets welcome visitors. Certainly the nets that we participate in here welcome visitors every time. Uh, special events are something to look for. Um, I'm not sure if it's still in progress, but there was the, a special event station for Route 66. I think that was last month. That uh, That's a great special event, and, and they generally have uh, special uh, certificates they award and things like that for special event stations. Uh, field day, we mentioned, is a great time to get on the air, and any contest. Get on the air during a contest. <clears throat> oh, there's a great question in uh, in chat and that's something we can address we should address that um scott has a question in in chat that i want to address because talking about making contacts depending on which band you're on determines which phone mode what which mode of ssb whether you're upper side band or lower side band so 160 80 meters and 40 meters are always lower side band and it's, again, today it's a gentleman's agreement. In the old days, it was because of the technology. We were forced to do that because of the way that we generated single sideband. That's why this became a, call it kind of a de facto standard. Uh, the exception to that, of course, is uh, um, 60 meters is upper sideband phone. All the other uh, bands, 20 in the WARC bands, 20, 15, 10, are all, up, we tend to use upper sideband. Now, there's nothing that says you can't run the opposite sideband. But we tend to stick to the to, so 160, 80, and 40, we run lower side band, uh, 60 meters, 20, 15, and 10, we run, and the work bands, uh, phone bands, we run low, upper side band, sorry, upper side band. So there's the answer to that question. That's a great question, by the way. Thank you for asking that. Okay. Um, one thing that's important when you're making contact, again, this is all about increasing your odds of making that contact. You've got to understand effective mean, the effective methods of calling and answering. It's a style. And it's, it's kind of a tradition, again, that's been handed down over many years of how you make a C, how you call CQ, how you answer a CQ, uh, how you conduct a QSO, a contact. There is a structure to it. 
And the simplest thing is a, a typical, you know, if it's just a casual exchange, uh, you're going to have a structure where you're going to, you're going to answer somebody's CQ, they're going to come back to you, they're going to give you a signal report, how strong is your signal, and they'll probably tell you where they live, their name and things like that, maybe what radios they're running, that's the sort of typical exchange. And then you'll, when it's returned to you, you do the same thing. You'll give a signal report. And that's kind of the traditional way to, to start out a QSO. Then you may end up chewing the rag, as we say. You may just have a nice conversation that could go on for how, however long you want it to go on. And uh, we've, uh, many of us have made many friends starting out with a CQ and, and it's ended up lifelong friends in ham radio. So, and understanding the timing, this is important too. And I think in, in the upcoming weeks, we're gonna talk a lot more about this in more detail, but timing is important. When do you call, when a station's calling CQ, when do you answer it? Uh, this is important to know that. And especially know how to use the features of your radio, know how to operate your radio, know how to set the mode upper sideband, lower sideband, uh, know how to use the filters because you'll want to use uh, filters in, in uh, specific cases. So uh, these are all things that you want to be aware of in operating your radio. How to put your radio in split mode. We talked about split operation. How does the, if you've got a modern radio, it operates split. How do you do that? So good things to know. Go ahead, Anthony. So this is really great information here. Tips for HF contest. Ask a ham friend to be there with you. Have somebody to coach you really, really helpful. Have somebody looking over your shoulder. Make sure that you're within your band mode and license allocation. This is important because the FCC does occasionally enforce this stuff. And we'll find uh, uh, folks getting a, uh, a little letter from the FCC that they were operating out of band or operating out of their license class. So this is something to be aware of. Again, your station, make sure your antenna, tuner, the radio, they're all set properly for the frequency you've chosen, that uh, if you're using an antenna tuner, that you, you've tuned the antenna up, you've tuned the, the system up so that you're not going to damage your radio. And that last line, I, I do a, a couple of talks on emergency communications, and I have, in that talk, I have a chart that's Dennis's three rules of communications. And rule number one is listen. Rule number two is listen. Rule number three is listen and listen some more. And this is the key to learning how to do this. Listen to how other operators do this. Listen to how they operate and find the best operators and mimic what they do. And you'll be successful. It's guaranteed. It's guaranteed. All right. And of course, we, you, the question was asked about this. I forgot that this chart was in here, Anthony, but yeah, choose the right mode based on band on SSB. Very important. Uh, if, you, uh, if you happen to be on uh, upper sideband on, on, let's say on 80 meters and you're calling CQ, you probably won't get anybody to answer you. Uh, and and uh, if you're listening on upper sideband, you'll wonder how come everybody sounds so funny and you can't tune them in. That's because they're on the, you're on the wrong sideband. They want to be on lower sideband. So 40, and one, 40, 80, and 160, you want to run lower sideband. So there's a trick, you know, it's just something you have to practice. The first time you try it, you may have problems with it, but tuning in a single sideband signal, it takes some practice. You'll get, you'll get the hang of it and it'll become second nature. It's, it's easy. And so uh, th this is uh, the ham radio for dummies, Ward Silver. We've had Ward on Rat Pack in the past. He's a wonderful speaker and he's also a wonderful author. And that's a great Great, great book to get if you're new to ham radio or you're new to HF, get yourself a copy of that and, and read that read that book cover to cover. You'll enjoy it and you'll gain a lot of knowledge from that. And there's also a website that goes along with oh, that's it. Right. So the yes. link uh, takes you out to give you the, the website. So don't right. miss the website along with the book. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, that's important. <laughs> But yeah, tuning a sideband signal in, uh, is, is tricky at first, but you'll get the hang of it. It's easy after a while. So I mentioned filters. Filters are important. You don't want to be running a real narrow filter trying to do sideband. You won't hear anything, but right, you're not going to hear anything. And if you run a wide filter on CW, you're like to you hear multiple stations at the same time. So narrow filters on CW and wider filters on sideband and we're limited to like three kilohertz on sideband so 2.7 is a great filter bandwidth that's a good one so go for that 
go ahead. Yeah, tips, stay in the band. Uh, a lot of hams, it, it, this next comment, I, I, I really can't stress this enough. Don't rely on what the display on your radio tells you, first of all, because you don't know. Just because I've got a digital display on my radio doesn't mean that that's the frequency I'm actually on. Did, was your radio calibrated? Did you calibrate it to a known standard? And we used to use, we still do, use WWV as a frequency standard. And we used to use, in the old days, a crystal calibrator, which was just a, a 100 kilohertz crystal that had lots and lots of harmonics all up through bands. And you'd zero beat that, uh, that uh, 100 kilohertz oscillator with WWV's carrier. And then you could look at the, the, uh, the harmonics of that every 100 kilohertz on the hand bands, and you could set the band edges pretty carefully. But you don't want to get too close, because you, you always have that possibility of operating outside the hand band or the allocation in the, the sub band within the, your allocation by your class and all of that license classification. So as, as stated here on upper side bands, stay at least three kilohertz below the top of the band allocation. I would tend to be a lot more than that uh, because your, your signal is three kilohertz wide. And if you happen, if you happen to set your VFO like two kilohertz from the top of the band and your signal is three kilohertz wide, you're outside the band and that's a violation of part 97. So this is a good rule of thumb, stay, stay within the band. Uh, and on lower side band, stay at, at least three kilohertz above the bottom of the band. Okay, these are, these are great rules. And like I say, I tend, to be, I tend to err on the side of caution and go farther in if I'm gonna be operating the band edge. And likewise on CW, stay 500 kilohertz or 500 hertz away, sorry, half a kilohertz, 500 hertz away from the band edge. Uh, just to be safe. And again, just because your radio says you're on whatever frequency it is, that's not necessarily true. Unless you've got a primary standard and you've calibrated your radio somehow. Uh, and those of us that are crazy enough to do that. Uh, I, you know, I have, um, I have some radios here that are, that are uh, use oscillators that are disciplined by GPS. So they're very accurate, but even they're in error. Like I, I don't go too close to the band edges and especially on phone tend to stay away. Uh, so there you go. Uh, the other thing uh, we mentioned here is the RIT. If you've never heard of RIT, receive incremental tuning or, or ZIT, however you want to pronounce that, transmit incremental tuning. If you're on a transceiver that has a single VFO, this allows you to have your VFO set on one frequency there you could transmit and then you can adjust your receive frequency with the RIT, also known as a clarifier. And this is typically, a clarifier was a, a sideband term to be able to tune in a single sideband signal uh, from, that, from your fixed VFO there, whatever frequency you're on. Um, make sure they're, they're turned off and they're set to, uh, uh, set to zero primary, uh, Really, you just want to turn them off and make sure they're not uh, not enabled. But they're very useful accessories to have on a modern transceiver is that receive incremental tuning or dual VFOs, one VFO for transmit, one VFO for receive. OK, some more tips. <laughs> yeah, RTFM. Yeah, I know that by another uh, acronym, but, but that's good. Read the fabulous manual or fantastic manual or whatever it is. Uh, do read the manual for your radio. If you've got a new radio, be familiar with the radio, understand how the radio functions, understand how the controls function, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there's lots of guidebooks out there for, for whatever your radio may be. Uh, lots of places to find other information and for a specific radio. We've got list manufacturers websites here. If for a particular radio that you might have, you can get a lot of information from the manufacturer's website. If you're into vintage radios, like yours truly, Boat Anchor Manual Archive is an incredible website that is, I call it crowdsourced. Folks upload old manuals to this website and there's just lots and lots and lots of manuals on older radios and even some more recent radios, believe it or not. Uh, it's a great, that's a great resource, Bama, Boat Anchor Manual Archive. Okay, then, then there's some books that have been published, and and these are a lot of these are new to me, Anthony. I had seen some of these. Well, some of these are videos also. But yeah, so the books though are wonderful. And, yeah. But 
videos. YouTube, there's all kinds of information on YouTube. Uh, 7300 is a great radio. I know that's a very, very popular radio these days. A lot of folks have those. There's a lot of information online about how to use the 7300. I think there's 30 or 40 videos in this yeah. series alone. That's amazing. That is just amazing. But Elecraft, if you're into Elecraft radios, uh, they make some really fine equipment. The, the K3 uh, is an incredible radio, but, but again, getting additional information beyond what the owner's manual tells you. There's lots of other books and, and uh, guides that are available. Um, geez. Uh, <laughs> yeah, Andrew Barrett, I had not run across those before. So uh, those, he actually spoke to our local club uh, okay. via uh, Zoom at the beginning of the pandemic, and uh, that's how I met him, and he does a nice job. Oh, that's great. That is really good stuff. Um, all right, speaking clearly. That's, a, that's an important thing. And again, setting your radio up correctly is, is important because remember, your radio's got all kinds of adjustments for your audio quality on transmit. You've got microphone levels, you've got speech compressors, you've got equalizers where you can vary the EQ of your audio. It's a good idea to have somebody help you. you, you do it on the air, have somebody local, a local ham. You can, you can get on the air on low power and set your controls on your radio. Uh, it's a good way to get feedback and understand how you've got your radio set. Have them help you with that. Um, use ITU or NATO phonetics. This is really important. Uh, we hear a lot of really cute phonetics out there. Um, sometimes the, the, the cute phonetics don't necessarily work that well. Uh, and that's why the comment here, carefully chosen alternatives. I get, uh, with my call sign, <laughs> unfortunately, I'm known as Dairy Queen, and that was a moniker given to me when I, even before I knew I had the uh, gr license grant, the, the grant of that call sign, one of my friends found that out, and I got the moniker of Dairy, Dairy I'm never going to get rid of that, I'm Delta Quebec, right, that's the proper ITU, Delta Quebec, so use prop, try to use proper ITU phonetics, especially if you're working DX. That's really a, a critical thing. So, so hopefully they're doing the same thing so you can understand each other better. Because so, many, many DX stations, if you're on phone, English is not their primary language. So you have to be aware of that. Know the Q signs. Know those Q codes uh, that are used for CW or phone. Uh, ham jargon. But, but as we say here, don't overuse it. A lot of folks overuse that stuff. But there, be aware, you know, listen. If you listen, you'll hear what people are using. And again, understand that typical parts of the QSO, like I mentioned earlier. We'll go into a lot more detail on that later. All right, signal reports. Uh, this is another thing that's, that's very subjective in many ways because you don't know how accurate your S meter is on your radio you know, unless you've calibrated it. And there are standards, believe it or not, for calibration. There are some accepted standards for calibrating an S meter. But if you're not in a contest, try to be accurate. Let the other station know what their signal is like. How strong are they? What, how clear is their signal? If you're on CW, what is the tone? You know, RST. Uh, is it a clean tone? You know, if you if if there's some distortion on the signal, let them know that there's distortion. Uh, this type of thing is really important. Uh, it helps them. It helps them, and you would hope that they would do the same for you if you were trying to get your station lined up and things set. If you're doing something that you're causing splatter or you've got some distortion on your signal, you would hope that somebody would tell you that as well. So that's an important thing. So if you're in a, in a, not in a contest, if you're just doing casual contacts, try to be accurate. But if you're in a contest, all bets are off. Or if you're working DX, all bets are off. Everybody's five nine nine. Everybody is 599 on CW. And the 5NN, that's a nice nice one to know on CW because that's a contraction, basically a, a pro sign for 599, 5NN. So did it dot it is a lot faster than sending did it it dot 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 it dot 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 it, right? So yeah, 5NN and CW and 59, just say 59 on phone. And don't bother with the accuracy because nobody really cares. If, if the station heard you, you're probably 5'9 anyway. So there you go. But as we say here, speed and consistency are far more important in a contest than having an accurate uh, signal report. Here's another link for you. If you want to bring that up, Anthony, I'm making your first contact. There you go. So again, the ARRL, there's a lot of good information on the ARRL website, and Anthony's got all these links in there, so do make use of those. 
and I think I'm taking over. You're taking over now. So over to Anthony. A lot of the things that Dennis has been talking about, I expand greatly in this presentation called How to Make That Cue So. Get in the rhythm, know the rhyme, and dance the dance. It talks about timing. It talks about where to tune uh, to make sure that you have the most success. So uh, this is a, a presentation I've done numerous times. It's available at tiny.cc slash r dash r dash d and uh, that's some homework for you also i also did a recent presentation for rat pack on checking your signal someone i was teaching another class and someone said they learned cw they got their poda set up all set up they went out in the field they tried to make contact and no one heard them what am i doing wrong is what she asked me and i said well there's a lot of things it can be so i actually sat down and put together this presentation this is designed to help you check to see whether you're actually getting out of, through both uh, different types of instruments, uh, different types of on the air, uh, having someone cooperate with you, and then also online things such as reverse beacon network and other things. So this was a Rat Pack presentation from 20 to August 2020, and also the slideshow is available. There's also, a number of passive and active methods for hams to let other know hams about on-air activity. We talked a little bit already about the DX cluster where people spot information, but there's also something called the reverse beacon network, and I talk a lot more about that in that presentation. But it's basically a system that uh, hears your signal at remote stations, decodes it using CW skimmer, and then posts all the information to the reverse beacon network aggregating site. So you can simply transmit a CQ with your call sign and it will report back. Whereas the DX cluster, if you're not a DX station, no one might report you. PSK reporter, if you're an FT8 operator, if you don't know about PSK reporter already, make sure you go through my slide presentation on FT8. It's a great website that shows all the activity of stations. Uh, you can look for your own station or other stations activity on PSK. Here's uh, information on the R RBN and on FT8. This is what PSK Reporter looks like, by the way. And uh, I have my friend's call sign in here right now. And if I look, I can see who was hearing him over the last 24 hours. I assume he was on. He's always on. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe that's not going to load right now. We won't wait for it to load. Um, on single sideband, unless, unless the passive RBN and PSK Reporter, uh, there's no way, there's no automated system out there that can detect your single sideband station signal decode what you're saying and then post it so we depend on dx clusters and spotting nets uh, they can be used for any mode they require individual hams though to decode and copy the information i have a whole website on propagation and spotting with a number of different spotting sites propagation uh, prediction sites etc at my uh, website k8zt.com uh, some reasons to get on during the uh, HF contesting. Even if you're not competitive, get on during contests. There's a higher activity level than most on most traditional bands. It gives you a chance to hone your operating skills with unfamiliar, unfamiliar call signs, pile-ups, etc. Work new grids, states, counties, countries, and even that new DXCC entity. And the thing about working during a contest is the stations in the contest want to work you. So you are points for them. So there's a good chance they'll pull out your signal during a contest and they might not pull it out during a casual CQ. Some other reasons, technician licensees can join in the fun on contesting, especially with 10 meters open. Other hams appreciate the contacts you provide. Uh, make sure you know your exchange and I have a whole presentation on different types of contest exchanges. Here's a long list of them and information on how to find those out for your particular area whether it's a CQ zone for the upcoming CQ worldwide at the end of October or uh, for an ITU contest so you can find out what zone you're in. The contests also allow you to evaluate your station's performance to experience and learn propagation effects uh, and it's your choice you can invest just a little bit of time in the contest make one or two contacts or you can go full time with butt in the chair and be competitive and uh, then you have to decide do you want to send in a log or not it's your choice don't worry the other stations won't get dinged if you don't send in a log um, the contesters uh, contest evaluations uh, assume that some stations won't be sending in logs so it's your choice but if you do send in a log you might get an award 
Correct. I have a whole presentation I did a couple of weeks ago for the Rat Pack group. Uh, I have a slideshow, uh, tiny.cc slash AR contest, and then the Rat Pack video is available. And this is an introduction to contesting. I was also involved uh, two years ago in designing a class for the AWRL. If you go to the AWRL Learning Center, there's a class called Introduction to Contesting. It's multiple modules. You also get this nice uh, PDF, brown, uh, PDF, leather bound PDF. I'm sorry, leather bound PDF. You have to provide the leather. We provide the PDF. It does require ARW membership, uh, but there are a free trial available for membership if you're uh, not currently a member. But I would suggest you become a member. And if you're interested in contesting, this is a great way to learn all the details so you can get started. All right. So uh, that's some great information. And uh, of course, we wanted to talk about activities on HF, and there's lots and lots of them. Uh, we've talked about contesting. Uh, we one of the other big big things is award you know award chasing. People want wallpaper, so things like county hunters is a good example of that. Um, the uh, there's a number of different uh, uh, awards that are out there, and of course, operating DX, working DX. That's really kind of the one of the probably one of the most uh, interesting parts of uh, being an amateur radio on HF and other you know, VHF as well on six meters and two meters working DX, but especially on the low bands on HF and, and uh, lower uh, nets. We have a lot of fun. Uh, my wife, Lisa and I, KF6QNG and myself, we operate on a lot of nets during the week. Uh, some of them are just sp like special interest vintage radio nets. I mentioned the AM net. We, we, we have an AM net that meets several times a week. Uh, Anthony mentioned POTA, Parks on the Air. Here's an event that's been taking place, Parks on the Air, Soda, Summits on the Air. If you like to, if you like the outdoors and you like to climb mountains, there you go. Summits on the Air is your thing. Another interesting activity is portable operation. Just taking a radio out in the field, setting it up and playing with it is, is kind of a fun thing to do. And I, you know, I don't do that so much anymore. That's kind of a field day thing for me. But boy, when I was younger, that was something I was doing all the time. And, and we didn't have all these fancy, lightweight, solid state radios back then. They were, they were boat anchors, but we still went out and did that. Mobile operation is a lot of fun. Putting an HF rig in your car and you find that there's a lot of activity on HF mobile. And folks want to talk to you because, you know, you don't always hear mobile stations on the air. So you tend to be an interesting station to talk to if somebody hears you calling CQ and you just sign that you're mobile. Um, of course, the other part of this is the, the, the maker part of it, constructing and building, building your own antennas, uh, building your own equipment from scratch or, you know, home brewing or building kits. I mean, there's still lots of kits out there that are available that you can put together. A big part of uh, amateur radio, of course, is emergency communications, and uh, we do a lot of MCOM on HF. Uh, the big thing that's that's on HF these days is WinLink, using WinLink. I happen to be the emergency coordinator for our ARIES group here in Eastern Kern County, and WinLink is a big part of what we do, and uh, we've got an exercise coming up in a week and a half that we'll be making a lot of use of that. So emergency com emergency communications. Traffic handling, national traffic system. We've got some Rat Pack videos on that, on NTS and uh, Radio Relay International. If that sort of thing sounds interesting, that's something to check out. We have traffic nets that are on both H on, on uh, CW and on phone. So something to look into. Uh, special modes, experimental modes. We talked about digital digital voice. Uh, there's uh, There's been some experimenting done over the years on spread spectrum as well. So these are things that are available out there to play with. And of course, if you look in the background here of my shack, <laughs> classic vintage boat anchors, we've got lots of them here. And that happens to be my passion in amateur radio is the uh, is collecting and uh, basically collecting and operating boat anchor radios. And we've got, we've got far too many of them, but it's a lot of fun and uh, not for everybody, but it's it's something that can uh, that can be a lot of fun to get into. OK, we talked about nets earlier. Um, so we mentioned this is an on the air gathering. Now, I've been talking about nets all through here. So most nets are on a schedule. They have they they have a regular schedule that they follow at a specific frequency. Uh, they're organized for a purpose, and some of those nets may be uh, like we say here, it may be a, a traffic net relaying messages. It could be a an awards 
uh, net. So you're chasing wor worked all states award, you're chasing US counties. There are nets that allow you to participate in the net to get those awards. Um, common topics of interest, I mentioned vintage radio, I mentioned AM, uh, even specific manufacturers of radios. Uh, I happen to be a member and a director of the Collins Collectors Association and have a lot of Collins radios. And we have a couple of nets that we run every week that are specific, you know, they're, they're geared towards Collins radio. You don't have to be running a Collins radio to play on that net, but we always like having visitors come on who are interested in learning more about Collins and Collins radio. That was one of the premier manufacturers of amateur radio gear here in the United States many years ago. Uh, weather nets, you know, severe weather, emergency nets, um, all of that, the, all these things, gatherings of friends. I mean, we've got groups, we've got nets that are just friends get together to chat, just like you would in a chat room, as, as was mentioned earlier. And these could be directed nets or undirected nets. Uh, directed nets, you have a net control operator and the net control operator is in charge. He's the traffic cop, but he, he takes a list of check-ins and, and then goes around to each, uh, each operator. Uh, and an undirected net, we talked about a round table earlier. We'll talk more about that in the next slide, what a round table is all about. I think the next slide's about round tables, if I'm not mistaken, maybe not. Oh yeah, it is coming up. Uh, it'll come up in a minute, uh, but we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, net resources, where you can find out about nets. There's lots of places. Google is your friend when it comes to finding nets, but, but Anthony's listed a whole bunch of links here and a bunch of resources that you can use for finding nets online. Uh, there's a lot that are, there are other, uh, I think of some other sources that aren't on here that have occurred to me, but, but this is a place to look if you're interested in checking out what a net is like on HF, that check out these resources. I mentioned Roundtable before, and this is, this is a, a little different. It is more like a chat room. There's no net control, but there is an order to it. It is an ordered operation. So you have you you take turns and you pass the pass the basically you're passing the mic to the next operator. Um, because of propagation changes, they can become difficult. Um, I can tell you in many years past, in a solar peak, a sunspot cycle peak, we had a round table going between five continents. <laughs> that was pretty cool. So you're relying on propagation and conditions in that, in that case, but we had people on, on five different continents in a round table, which is pretty amazing. Uh, unlike using a repeater, there's no beep at the end of a conversation. Uh, and, and there's on AM, there's at least a carrier that goes away when the person turns off their transmitter. On sideband, there's nothing. So knowing when it's your turn can be difficult sometimes. You have to listen to the other operators and operator has to be very specific about handing the, the uh, frequency over to the next operator by call sign and all of that. And like I says, no visual cues. Uh, like if we're on a, in, a, in a chat, we're chatting on Zoom, we have visual cues to go by. We don't have any of that on, on, on radio. So something to, to, to pay attention, I, I will share something on that one. We had a Rat Pack uh, speaker on here uh, sometime back talking about life without full duplex and it's talking about simplex conversation something worth going back and checking out that uh, that uh, rat pack on youtube life without full duplex so these are these are the, some listings of some of the awards worked all states these are u.s states worked all states worked all continents dxcc this is the dx century club means that you have to work at least 100 countries and have them confirmed. This has become a lot easier these days through FT8 and Logbook of the World. Logbook of the World, and it, it, prior to now, prior to Logbook of the World, you actually had to have a, in hand a, a, a QSL card. In other words, a confirmed contact with that DX station. And you'd go to a, a, a card counter who would then go through your cards and check, you know, check or card checker, check off your QSL cards to see how many cards you've got and if they're all valid and you, DXCC. If you qualify, you get your certificate. It's a lot easier today with Logbook of the World. Worked all zones. CQ has uh, what they've broken the world up into. And like the ITU regions, these are zones. So worked all zones is a big one. Prefixes, worked all prefixes. Uh, there's actually a contest called WPX. And uh, that's a good one to get involved with. That's a good DX contest. Uh, there's some awards and certificates that, that Anthony's listed here. These are some ones to go and check out. 
Uh, you want to, I don't know if you want to open some of those up, Anthony. Um, yeah, the VA3, uh, RJ, has a very good website, and he has a lot of resources. And one of them is you can go through by country and find awards based on different countries. That's pretty cool. But I, that's one good one to start out with. He also has one for U.S. contest. I mean, I'm sorry, excuse me, for U.S. awards. So he has both the DX awards and U.S. awards. It's good stuff. All right. So I'll turn it back if, over to you, Anthony. If we've piqued your interest, uh, there's some other slideshow presentations I've done. I've already mentioned one of them tonight, but we also did a VHF UHF series. Uh, I did one on uh, for technicians. We're going to talk about buying radio equipment next week, but if you want to get a head start, you can look in my uh, buying amateur radio transceiver. So we're to the question and answer portion. If you want to shoot this QR code, it'll give you the link to the slideshow. Uh, just one second on this. I'm also going to say that we're next week we're going to jump into week two. So be ready for next week. We will also post this recording. We will also post a, a PDF version of this slideshow. But if you click on this link right now, you're going to see the whole thing. So you can get a preview of weeks two and three if you're interested. But remember, it's subject to my whims of changing and editing. Uh, <laughs> so it may change slightly. So <laughs> what we're going to do now is we're going to try and uh, go ahead and take some questions and answers here. Uh, first of all, we've had some in the chat. A lot um, in the chat. Chat's been real busy. I've been watching. Yeah, it. one of the questions was about the Ward Silver book. It's it's it is six years old, but it still is pretty good information. It's very Ward always uh, goes for the basic information that you need to get started. So it's pretty good. It is lacking, of course, on FT8 and FT4 because they weren't really around then. Um, started yeah we will be posting the video uh sometime tomorrow i'll get the video up there uh, i think we're pretty much caught up on the rest of the chat